what I want to do today is talk to you about this concept, this concept that almost every organization in the world is thinking about. And it's about experience. It's about experience. It could be learning experience, could be employee experience, could be human experience, could be people experience. It could be an experience like sitting on a couch watching me speak. That's an experience, right? Like you guys look really comfortable there. Thumbs up. So all of that being said, everyone talks about experience. And it's one of the top things on CHROs and CEOs' minds right now. And I want to share with you more about that throughout the session today and give you some tools, some tools, some tips, and some stories that you can actually take back and use within your organizations. I'm going to start with a video. And I almost beg your forgiveness on the video because you guys have all seen, you guys have all heard, and you guys all know what's going on in the world around us, different, in different parts of the world. But I'm going to start with this video, something that we created, and then I'm going to go into a little bit of a story. This pandemic has many people stressed out, anxious, and lonely. A new report shows nearly half of U.S. workers have been suffering from mental health issues since the COVID-19 pandemic struck. It has been a year of isolation. Schools closed, travel ground to a halt. A sheer amount of need can feel impossible to comprehend. People are quitting their jobs in droves in what's been dubbed the Great Resignation, pushing job vacancies to all-time highs. 54% of respondents are looking to change jobs, and 43% say their career paths have stalled or, quote, slowed to a crawl. There's a huge population that basically says they don't want to come back. What do these companies need to do to retain these employees? What's behind all the dissatisfaction and turnover? Employees have more choice than ever. Quit, change job, that's tightening the labor market further. Of the 1.1 million workers over age 20 who left the workforce in September, 80% were women. They've been disproportionately impacted. One in four women are considering downshifting their careers or leaving the workforce. You're having to choose between family and your career like never before. Mothers often work what we call a double shift at home. What we're seeing now is that they're working what we're calling a double, double shift. This being home thing is scary. Mental health is at the top of the agenda for pretty much every organization. As healthcare workers are taking taking care of us day in and day out. Who is taking care of them and what kind of mental health toll are they facing? There's been a significant jump in full-time workers in the U.S. who are dealing with mental health issues during this pandemic. How are you? <laughs> I am exhausted. So you guys, that video shows things that you know that you feel, that you've been feeling for a long time. But guess what it also talks to? It talks to our need to create experience, to create F, feeling. And you heard numbers of speakers talk about empathy that we're going to talk about throughout. Now, if you take a look at this slide, uh, for those of you that can't see me, that's me actually, but 15 years ago, actually 17 years ago, I got into this particular space of working with organizations around the world because of those two other humans on that slide. Those are my two sons. They're 17 and 14. Uh, they're Ben and Alex. And my goal back then, and it's still my goal today, was to try to create a future of work that made sense to them. Does that make sense to you? I know it's weird to say, wow, you're doing that? That's big. I was like, yeah, but they, when they go to work and when they actually start working in the working world, like, I think I can make an impact. I think that I can make an impact and make it somehow feel like as they move from school to work, that it doesn't suck. And I'm going to talk more about that in a few minutes. But when we think about experience, we're going to talk about that in more detail. So today, we're going to talk about this concept of the now of work. And I would love it 
if you take nothing else away from the session, that you start to think about what that term means, now of work. I started using it back in March of 2020 when people are like, I wonder what the future of work's gonna be. We need to start planning for the future of work. I was like, whoa, it's the now. Like we're not, we can't think, like how many of you can predict what the future of work is gonna look like in a year? Two years, four years. Anyone wanna come up here and do it? If anyone does, feel free. We, I, we, I don't think you can, but guess what? Think about what year it was last year. It was 2020, and do you remember this thing called Y2K? Were any of you around? Yeah, you were around. Do you know what we started to talk about right after Y2K? This thing called Workforce 2020. Does anyone remember that? Like, we were really cool. We're predicting 2019, 2019 years ahead. And guess what? Everyone's going to be working on a mobile device and having a Target notification pop up saying 20% off clothing and shoes. And, oh, cool. I'm going to be wearing a watch that's going to be able to tell me when someone needs me. And guess what? I'm going to be looking at, as Dan did earlier, a box on a screen, and that's how I'm going to be seeing people. If you actually read, go back and do this sometime. Not, don't take too much time. But read what was published in 2001 and 2002 about Workforce 2020. It's exactly where we are today, sans pandemic. Does that make sense? Like, people weren't going to go to the office anymore. Like, whoa, that was actually said? People were going to be looking at each other on boxes on screens. That was actually said? People were going to be using devices? That was actually said. But if you think about it, what did we do over that 18 years to prepare for that, that 19 years to prepare? <laughs> you're shaking your head. Some of us did, I'm not sure if you're shaking your head, good or bad, but some of us did a lot to just start to think about it. But in reality, most organizations are like, we moved to the cloud. That's not enough. So we're going to talk about what that means in the role of experience today. At LeapGen, we're lucky enough to work with organizations around the world in helping them think through this. And I always share this slide not to talk about the slide, but more to talk about the fact that all of these organizations have one thing in common. And the thing in common is that they are transforming the people function. Raise your hand if you're transforming your people function today. Shut up. This is going to be interactive, you guys. I told them I might have to get off stage. So every single person in this room is transforming their people function. Right? Yeah, truly, you are. You're all transforming your people function. Whether you call it that or you're not, you're changing. Right? Trans means change. Now, if work has changed, if workers have changed, if business has changed, if life has changed, what should we do as professionals? Stay the same? Probably not. It's probably not the best idea to stay up with the times. Okay, so when we think about that, it's really important to keep that in mind. And what we all do, really on a day-to-day -day basis, are these three things. We develop strategies, then we deploy those strategies, and then we hopefully sustain the strategy. This is what you all do, right? You come up with a strategy, get buy-in, you deploy it. Notice I'm not using the word implementation. Implementation is part of a deployment, okay? And then you sustain that strategy. You treat your strategy like a pet, not like a rock. Does that make sense? You don't just put it in and say, okay, I'm done with that. You take care of it. By the way, a lot of us do that with software. We put it in, never do anything with it. We're like, oh, no, I'm done with that. Check, move all the people off the program. Like, we have to think about how do we treat these things like pets, not like rocks. And with all of this stuff going on around us, Weird recovery, weird resignation, realization, reshuffle, blah, 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 blah. It makes strategy even A, more important, but B, 
crucial because we have all these things that are changing. So we've got these categories of people quitting. People are making the choice between good and better. People are making the choice between bad and worse. People are just quitting. Can we save them? In some cases, yes. In some cases, no. Really important to think through. So in a talent war, like we're in today, and forget the war part, because that's not the right term, we're really in a standoff. And the talent is going to win. Not the employer, the talent, we. I, I never thought about doing this, but I'm going to do it. How many of you are thinking about changing companies that you work for right now? I knew I shouldn't have done that. You know the stats that say 48% or 44%? Like here we only have three people. Because, because my boss is sitting next to me or my colleague sitting next to me, et cetera, et cetera. Probably not a good idea to do that. But all that being said, with all these people thinking, thinking about quitting or thinking about changing, what should we do as employers? We should think about how do we keep them. We should think about how do we re-onboard them to the new now of work. Did you hear what I said? Re-onboard them to the new now of work. Because the way that they were onboarded before doesn't necessarily meet the way that we work today. And we've seen so much change. We've seen so much change. So that being said, think about this question. It's 2021 right here, outside of work. When you're at work, what year is it? What does it feel like? Okay, when you go onto your intranet or portal and you type in, I'm having a baby, what's the first thing that comes up? Try it. If you're moving and you type into your intranet or portal, I'm moving, what's the first thing that comes up? It's not what you're looking for. I guarantee it. When you go to your intranet or portal and say, I want to learn Python, what's the first thing that comes up? In most cases, it has nothing to do with what I'm looking for. We actually did a survey, and you know when we talk, if the people actually go and say, I'm having a baby, you know what comes up? That we offer birth control as an organization. But you know the, to find out what to do if I'm having a baby within the company, you know what to search for? I'm having a dependent. Think about that for a second. That's HR speak, right? Not employee speak, not human speak. So when you think about this, think about how easy is it to get stuff done outside of work? Order something off Amazon, order an Uber, find a date. How easy or hard is it? It's pretty easy, right? What about inside of work? What year would you say it feels like inside of work? Just think about it for a second. This became the status quo in 2008. So can your employees search on everything and get everything done on their mobile device today? Just raise your hand. What year does it feel like inside your organization? What do you guess? 2002. 2002. How about over here? Anyone? What year? 2015? 2018? How about you, ma'am? 2018? So can you talk into your phone and get an answer? I'm moving. What should I do? Can your employees do that? I'm having a problem with my computer. What should I do? I want to take a class on Python. 
Think about that for a second. That's the experience that we have outside of work. But when we get inside of work, what oftentimes happens? We lose the fact that we're humans outside of work and get into work. So if you think about the past, we had postcards, we had happy hours, we had 1-800-CALL-HR. How inviting does that sound? We have intranets and portals called My HR. And really what they were is nothing but link farms. Series of links, click here to go to Workday, click here to go to Oracle, click here to go to SAP. That really helps me. Who's laughing? Why? <laughs> No, it's silly. Well, yeah, it's silly, but it's real, right? I mean, it's what we all do to people. So we were working with an organization not too long ago who sent out an email from Human Resources. That's already a losing battle. But they sent out an email from Human Resources that says, come click, or excuse me, come kick the tires on our new LMS. And the, in the email was a picture of a race car. That's it, that with, and if you clicked on the race car, it took you somewhere. How many people do you think actually read the title of that email and said, what's an LMS as an employee? And oh, by the way, I've just got lots of time to come kick the tires. I have nothing else to do in my life. This is a big healthcare organization. Then come kick the tires. So when we think about that, we have to think about this concept that we live in today, that every organization the organization or the function is going through a digital transformation. And digital does not just equal technology. So this particular slide is the slide that I would ask, and I always wish it'll happen, it'll happen at some conference I speak at someday, that you would get tattooed on your body. Okay, it doesn't have to be visible, but just somewhere where you remember it. There are four components of success today in what you do. Four components, and they all align to purpose, which is the purpose of your organization. And those four components are A, what's our mindset and vision? B, who am I designing for? C, what is the journey that I want them to go on? And then D, what's the technology? And you guys are going to get copies of these slides if you want them, so you don't have to write all this down. But in the, you see in the boxes, it talks about what the four key things are for each of them. For mindset, it's adaptation and getting alignment. It's fascinating when you work with HR leadership teams and you say, what's most important to you? Recruiting, learning, comp, performance, payroll, HR operations. I'm like, oh, everything's most important. No, you need to get alignment and agree that, by the way, some of the stuff we're doing might not be stuff we should do anymore in this new now of work. Second, how do I design for people? How many employees do you think know what position management means? If you actually did a survey of your employees as to what they think position management means, you probably wouldn't want to see the results. I thought it's hilarious that I got a Peloton and the first online course was called position management. How to sit on the bike. I'm like, I can't get away from this stuff. But position, who is it designed for? C, how do people get there? That's the journey and process. That's the experience. And then D, the technology. Notice the percentages at the bottom. That's the level of effort it takes for you to transform. Where do most people put most of their emphasis? Anyone? Technology. The technology is amazing. We have the best technology we've ever had in the world today. The best ever in the HR, learning, human capital space. But we have the worst Adoption. And the reason why is because we don't think about those other things. We're working with an organization that we I talked to last week who said, we rolled out the talent profile in Workday and no one's using it. So 
Why are you? <laughs> we, <laughs> yeah, so I, you know, I was like, well, okay, so what's the issue? They're like, we're going to do an RFP for a new talent profile. I'm like, guys, the fact that they're not using it has nothing to do with the vendor. It has everything to do with the fact that they don't see any value in using it that you didn't market it correctly, and your journey to get there was sucky. It's not a really good word, but didn't make sense. Like it wasn't right in front of them. So when we think about experience, we're gonna talk about that. Now, this is something that, this is one of my favorite exercises to do with HR organizations around the world, is to, and I ask you guys all to do this. Take these slides and do this. Say, what do we want to be great at versus what is it okay to be okay at? It is fascinating. It's like a reality TV show to me. Because guess what? If you know what you want to be great at, what can you do? Design that way. Prioritize. Sequence. Focus. But if every COE, does everyone know what a COE is? thinks that they are the most important and they have to do everything great versus just be 100%. By the way, 100% is really good. Do I want to be 125% accurate at payroll? Don't say yes. 100, wouldn't 100% accurate all the time be great? Like It's perfect. I just need to be performing. Do I want to be 100% at compliance? Totally. Do I want to be best in the world at recruiting? Maybe, if I'm hiring. Does that make sense? Maybe if I'm hiring. We're working with an organization, it's an oil and gas company, they're like, hey, we plan to be flat, and we have a 3% turnover, and we need a new recruiting system. They're like, hmm. What do I want to be great at? And at the same time, realizing when I think about experience, I often have to just simplify to become unique. In those areas that I want to be great, I have to get rid of all of these weird customizations that I've done. Sir in the blue shirt, what's your name? Yeah. Is that your real name, or were you afraid to? He's like, oh, uh, Mike? Thanks. So Mike. We, you know, oftentimes you ask organizations, like, why do you do things a certain way? And you know what they'll say? Well, Mike, Mike did that. Mike made that decision. You know, we do it because Mike said so. I'm like, oh, cool. Let's talk to Mike. Mike hasn't worked here for three or four years. I was like, so why do you have 19 approvals in place? Well, because that's what Mike did. And it's fascinating that Mike's get blamed or praised for these things, yet they're oftentimes things that don't really add a lot of value. They don't help me go faster. They don't help me be great at those things. When we think about experience, we also get into this concept of listening and acting. Listening and acting. And notice on the screen, managers are a key to that. So when you deploy learning capabilities, is it important to have managers on your side? Yes or no? It's really important to keep this in mind because do you know who employees work for? The manager. They don't work for you. I know that's weird for HR people to think about, but the employees don't actually work for you. They work for that manager. And if the manager is not on board and the manager doesn't believe in it, guess what they tell the employee to do? Don't worry about it. Have you ever heard that with performance reviews? Oh, don't worry about it. They're a waste of time. Or let's just have a quick conversation and be done with it. We'll check the mark box that I did it. So managers need to be front and center. They need to listen and act. And when we think about that, we have to think about this experience shift. Have you ever heard of the word and the phrase HR technology? That's what we're here for, right? Think about what that means if you switch it around. Technology for who? HR. We live in a world today where the technology needs to start with the workforce. It starts with me. And if it starts with me, guess what I get? Better data. 
If it starts with me, guess what? I can drive a better experience. If it starts with me, guess what I can do? Feel engaged, feel like it's an experience. But if all I do is push HR stuff to an employee and say, do it, that's where we struggle. I didn't talk a ton about my background, but I used to lead product and strategy for a company called PeopleSoft. Anyone ever heard of that? It's always interesting to know when you're <laughs> too old, when people don't hear of the companies anymore. Anyone ever hear of DOS? when I was with Ceridian Corp, or Control Data, or Ceridian Corporation. But at PeopleSoft, we rolled out this thing called self-service, and people were like, no one's using it. Gartner said we were the best in the world at self-service, and that CHROs and CIOs would say, no one's using it. Do you know at that time, that was the time where, I don't know if you remember this, but America Online CD-ROMs used to fall out of magazines. You used to have these things called 2400 baud modems, that if you actually got connected and the other line rang, it would disconnect you. Some of you have no idea what I'm talking about. But the reason that people didn't use self-service is because, like, seriously? Like, I'm going to get online on a phone line and do it. And we still work with organizations that have people stop. They're like, why doesn't it work on the iPad? Like, why is this old version not work on the iPad? There was no such thing as an iPad in 1999. Everyone gets that, right? Most of our tools were not designed in a B2Me model. So today, today, one of the things that we need to do is shift our focus from just getting people connected to building connection. Shifting from just getting connected is like, oh, cool. If everyone's got access, we're good. To how do we build connection with people in a digital manner? Guess what? If I do that, they're going to be ready to talk about their skills. They're going to be ready for us to deploy capabilities to help them be better. They're going to give us data so that we can make a personalized experience. But if we don't do that, guess what? We're fighting a losing battle. We can buy all the technology in the world. But if we don't think about it and change the mindset, we're always going to be, but why is no one doing it? Like, how many of you fill out your LinkedIn profile easier than you, easier, like desire, than fill out your talent profile in your company? Almost everyone. And the reason why is because it adds value to you. If you ask everyone to fill out their talent profile and then you do nothing with it, sorry, you do nothing with it, guess what they think? It's the same thing with engagement surveys. It's the same thing with Pulse. If you don't act, back to the other word, people aren't going to do anything with it. So people always get scared when I talk about this because they're like, well, what about the humans? We work with organizations that have business partners that are like, digital is going to take away my job. Digital is going to enhance your job. Does that make sense? Digital is not going to take away your job. Digital is going to enhance your job. Someone asked me this question. I was sitting at a bar in Singapore after giving a key. I don't even know why I said that. Sorry. <laughs> that was a weird way. I was uh, at an event. Sorry. Forget the bar part. But I was at an event, and someone stopped me afterwards and asked me this question, like, when are machines going to replace HR people? When do you think machines are going to replace HR people? Anyone? Never. That's the, I, I mean, I, it, was the it, was, <laughs> it was not a good question. If you think about it right. So sitting in that place in Singapore that one night, I came up with this model. I'm like, guys, there's three things. There's three things that we do as HR. There's hands work, there's heads work, and there's hearts work. Think about that. Hands work, heads work, and hearts work. What do you want to do? What do you want to do? Hands work? Data entry all day long? 
No, you want to do the heart's work, right? Heart's work is where the humanity comes into play. Head's work is when you can take data, like you heard from Nancy yesterday, to tell stories. So the more that we can get out of the hand's work and shift to doing the head's and the heart's work, that's what digital is about. That's the core of digital. And that's what our experience needs to drive. So before I jump into this, how many of you have a digital people strategy that everyone in HR agrees to? Not a technology project plan, a digital strategy that talks about mindset, audience, journey, and tech. You guys do? Raise your hand if you do. Two, two tables, awesome. You guys should teach a class afterwards. But this is really important, and I, I kind of beg you guys to do this, because if you don't have this, it's really hard to know what you're doing. First of all, it starts with this, what's, a, what's our story? What's our 30-second cocktail napkin pitch on what we're doing? Second, what are our guiding principles? Third, what, how do we want it to feel? What are the attributes? And then fourth, how will we measure success? If I get this, and my HR leadership team is combined with IT and understands this, guess what it gives me? Clarity, alignment, and targets for success. The days, I'm going to say this, and I mean it to the bottom of my heart, it, the days of the go-live party should be dead. <laughs> How many of you have go-live? How many of you have ever been to a go-live party? I think they're fascinating. Um, go-live should be changed to go-begin. Like, the going live isn't, shouldn't be like the celebration. The celebration should be, hey, guys, guess what? Now we're ready to start seeing value. Now we're done. Oh, thank God. That nine months was terrible. It should be about the go begin. And if I have a digital vision, my measures of success are not go live. My measures of success are things that tie back to the business. Here's an organization that we work with. Um, oh, this one's from a company called iHeartMedia. Some of you have heard of iHeart or iHeartRadio. Um, their vision statement, our workforce experience mirrors the way we live outside of work and reflects our external brand so that employees feel the energy and passion of our consumer audience. That's cool. Like easy, simple, maybe a little wordy. But what are their guiding principles? That no matter what happens, if anyone comes to us and says, hey, guess what? I was just at a conference and I want to go buy something. They're like, it has to be simple. It has to be flexible, it has to be equitable, it has to be innovative, and it has to be proactive. If it's not that, guess what? It doesn't fit our experience vision. It doesn't fit our digital vision. Does this make sense? It's guardrails that you put in place. And then what do you do? And once again, you'll get these slides. Sorry, you can't see that. You check the boxes. Mike, what's simple? What does simple mean to you? Easy to use. What does easy to use mean to you? I'm sorry? No instruction needed. Great to check the box, right? Check the box. We achieved that. OK? What does engaging mean? Someone say, hey, guess what? It needs to be engaging. What does that mean to you? These are hard, right? But if you think about them and do them, this is the number one thing we do with organizations. If you create this, then you've got your check boxes to understand whether you're successful. So as we get into the experience discussion, as work doesn't look the same, HR can't look the same. And if we look at the wish list of what people are talking about today, employee or human experience is right there at the top. Employee experience matters more than ever. One of the big mistakes we make is we think that experience is just the user interface. Did everyone hear what I just said? We think ex employee experience equals user interface. 
a couple things I'm going to share with you. First of all, you should never call your employees users. How many of you do user testing? User acceptance testing? That's not right. It should be humans. It should be people. They're not users. Okay, very important to keep in mind. But we live in this world where because of this, experience matters more. And what we need to do is get this into our head that it, the days of just implementing tech are over. What people care about when it comes to experience is deploying capabilities. The best way to do that, and you heard someone talk about this earlier today, is design. Design for the empty chair. This is a concept that Amazon made very, very famous. And what is the empty chair? The empty chair is this. When you're in a design session, look what this is. This is an empty chair. I'm rolling out a new tool, a new capability. Who do I want it to make sense to? The empty chair. Not to me, but to the empty chair. And guess what? I somehow made the decision to do this thing called minimum viable product. Have you ever heard of that? Uh, we don't have time. We just have to do minimum viable. Sorry, chair. Do you know what the chair does to minimum viable product? Why are you guys laughing? It's the exact same thing you do when you download an app that you don't like. What do you do? Delete it. How often do you go back to see if it gets better? You don't. Why don't you like it? Because someone said, oh, I'm just going to roll out minimum viable, except what I have time for. That worked fine when our audience was us, because we could roll out crap to us. But when the audience is that chair who has another job, it needs to be minimum lovable product, MLP not MVP. Does that make sense? Because they have to buy into it. And then over time, guess what? It's going to shift from thinking about adoption to addiction. How many of you are addicted to an app on your phone? Anyone? No, this is where people don't raise their hand either. I don't even know why I asked that. Some. But you know, if you think about it, like, do you know that every single day these apps get better? Do you ever look at your app store like, 77 updates, because they do a little thing. Now, every time they do that, you don't go through change management training, email read. How many of you read all those notes? Oh, they're just there. Because guess what? You're already addicted. So keep using it. Now it just gets better. But if you roll out minimum viable, you don't have a chance. And that's really important when we think about humanity. So ask yourself this question always. We're humans outside of work. Yet inside of work, are we asking people to do unhuman things? How many of you have kids? Raise your hand. How many times a year do you ask your kids how they are? Once? No. How many times a year do you ask your employees how they are? <laughs> Mike, once? That's unhuman. How many times do your kids, if you have kids that are of this age, check to see what their grades are on their devices every single day? Because they want to, in fact, mine want to get a heads up before I do so they can tell me that something's missing. Do your employees do that? Can they see how they're performing? So outside of work, we're humans. We have all these abilities. Inside of work, we're unhuman. So there's some things that we do as people functions when it comes to experience to that we can change. And this is hard because it requires T. What's T? Trust. Stop monitoring people and start enabling people. As key goals, stop checking up on people. Like, I mean, there's someone I talked to last, there's a company I talked to last week that said, right now, because of this whole return to work thing, which is the stupidest term ever, this return to office thing, which is better, that people are actually, the company is taking attendance to see if people are coming in. Desk workers, 
taking attendance. Sorry if that's any of you. That's checking up on people. We need to check in on people and ask them three, a question that's just three words. How are you? Mike, how are you? Good. It should be that easy. Green, yellow, red. Are you green? Are you yellow? Or are you red? Green's good. Red's not good. You're probably green? Okay. How about you? What are you, ma'am, in the red shirt? Okay. Green? How about you next to her? Green? How about on the couches? Okay. But what would you do if someone's red? Sorry, you have to leave. No, you'd work, you'd help them, right? But guess what that is? Data. Data in real time. How many of you think data is sexy? It's a really weird question, I get it. But data is the sexiest thing we have. Not we as people, but we as a function. Because what we can do with data is start to really design and not just count people, but what? What's the other part of that phrase? Not just count people, but make people count. Our job for so long has been counting people. Headcount reports, compliance reports, all that stuff has to happen. But in today's now of work, we need to make people count. To make them count, we need to walk in their shoes. We need to design for them. How many of you got the degreed socks in your bag? See, mine fall over. Ah, oh, nice, you're wearing them too. Now, why would DeGreed think it was cool to put socks in a, sorry, put socks in a bag? Because they know their audience. How many of you got a bottle opener? Now, why would DeGreed do that? What are they saying about us? Interesting. But when we think through that, they know their audience, right? Do we know our people enough to start thinking about that, which is the concept of personas. How many of you use personas? Personas are a way of life for us in, that we should work with every day. What personas allow us to do is infuse empathy. If someone says, how do we be more empathetic when it comes to work? Focus on personas. Why would a persona infuse empathy? Anyone? because you're asking questions about a person and you'll be able to talk to them. Like, your shoes are amazing. They're Adidas, and you have Pepsi socks. Do you work for Pepsi? So, how do you feel me calling you out like that? Weird, but yeah. But think about that. From a persona standpoint, look at how I can communicate. Because I'm kind of understanding her, taking a little bit of time. But if I didn't see that, what would I do? Who knows? Do we know what our employees want? When we think about personas, here, I, I included in the deck a couple personas. We work with an organization called Land O'Lakes. Have you ever heard of Land O'Lakes? Dairy co-op organization. And basically, you know, here's Hannah. She's a person who wants to do things by, for herself She's in the office, but look at that quote. My onboarding was a mess. I wish I had someone to reach out to, but I didn't really know anyone besides my manager. Guess what I can do if I know Hannah? Design for Hannah. Here's Naya. Naya's an employee that wants to move up in the organization. What's she thinking? Guess what I can do if I know what she's thinking? Design for her. It leads us to this discussion about processes and journeys. You heard a speaker earlier talk about journeys. And jour someone asked about journey mapping. We've been so focused on, pro who are, what do processes do? Processes generate data. What do journeys do? Journeys generate feeling. Processes generate data, but journeys generate how I feel. If you go online, Mike, 
What's what's the last thing you ordered on Amazon? A shark costume? <laughs> Sorry. A shark costume. Cool. That's the weirdest answer I've ever gotten when I asked the question. But good. A shark costume. What if... <laughs> What if he, I'm sorry to laugh. What if he ordered the shark costume and once he clicked on it, buy, it said, okay. And that's it. It doesn't say when it's coming. All it says is okay. Or maybe even cooler, it says saved. What did he do? He completed a process. What if that's all you got? You're like, Cool. I don't know when it's coming, where it's coming. How do you feel? Kind of like done. Like, what do I do now? That's a process. Think about the journey. Once he orders the shark costume, what comes into his email? Confirmation that he got, ordered it. Then what? Tells him when it's coming. Then what? Then it tells me when it's 10 stops away from his house. <laughs> then what? It takes a picture of it on your front door. That's a Does that make sense, you guys? That's a journey. And guess what? He feels connection. But if it's just a process where he went to a link farm on his portal, clicked on sh shark costumes, <laughs> for, you know, navigated to costumes, animals, shark, large, order, he'd be, sorry, more than likely he'd abandon. Does that make sense? He would never get, so I always say a process is good, but if you can't get to the, if you can't get to it, and it's buried under something called the name of a system, you're wasting a great process. So your journey is so, so important. What matters when you think about that is transaction would just be the order, but all of the other stuff that I just went through with Mike is the interaction. That's what makes experience. And when I'm going through, here's a journey map for onboarding, and you'll see as we're going through the journey, what am I doing? Asking one simple question. How is the person feeling at each step? Because if all of a sudden Mike orders the shark costume and it just says okay, guess what? He's probably like, I'm not feeling really so sure it's going to be here by Halloween. I'm just guessing that's why you ordered it. But, or my shark costume party or whatever it was I was going to. I'm just guessing that, uh, that, that it's going to be here. And that, guess what? He starts to feel yellow. And then all of a sudden right before Halloween and it's not here, and he can't dress as a shark, he ends up dressing like a cowboy. And the theme was a shark costume party. <laughs> Guess what? He's like, wow, now I feel red. And then when a recruiter calls him, what's he do? Yeah, I'll talk to you. I'm really frustrated with how things go here. I feel red. Now I mixed analogies there, but does that make sense? If he abandons, if he doesn't feel good during the journey, it's hard. And when we're thinking about those personas, what's so important and what people are struggling with right now is this, is this whole concept of return to work or return to office, what is that? We're only taking into account the physical component. We're not taking into account the emotional component, how do you feel, the social component, how do you want to collaborate, the spiritual component, how does it tie to my values, and then the learning or the knowledge component to it. How many days does it take to build a habit? Does anyone know this? Somewhere between 20 and 70. Let's use 70. How many days have most people been away from the office if they're a desk worker? More than 70. Guess what? They changed. There's no snap. Up, oh, done. We're going back. People learn new ways of doing stuff. And guess what? It worked. Stuff they probably should have done all along. So in these slides that you'll get, what's the physical part of it? It's where we work. What's the emotional part? It's how we feel. 
The social part, how we build relationships. The spiritual part, are we tied to our values? And the intellectual part, how do we continue to grow? And so often we forget that the whole person is who we're designing for, not just one component. So in today's world, everything is part of this concept of a digital workplace when we think about experience. You all own the digital workplace. And what does HR need to do right now? What can you do right now? Go back and focus on experience, not technology. Every HRIS function in the world should be renamed and focus on experience. Solutions, not just tools. Enablement, not just monitoring. People, not just capabilities and outcomes. Could you turn up the lights again, whoever's doing all that? Thank you, I'm sorry I was moving on and off stage. How many of you have changed your vision, your direction, what matters to HR in your organization in the last six to 12 months? Raise your hand high if you have. Raise your hand high if you feel like you're still doing the same old thing you were doing before. What we see in organizations around the world right now is they're missing out on this magical opportunity. Work changed, workers changed, business changed. When's the last time that all happened globally all at the same time? Anyone? Not in our time. So we have this magical opportunity to think different. And there's a video I'm gonna play for you guys in a second where we actually talk, and it actually talks about, and I'm happy that, to sh once again, you'll get this afterwards, but to share kind of where we're at. And I got a little too passionate. We do a, a daily meet, or we do a, a weekly meetup every Friday. And I got a little too, Bush, by the way, you're all welcome to join, uh, that just talks about this stuff and talks about experience and talks about work. But I got a little too passionate on it. So I'm gonna play this video of me getting way too passionate, and then I'm gonna open it up for questions. I'm kind of losing my patience. Uh, I'm losing my patience with HR organizations that aren't changing. How many more reports? How many more studies of mental health? How many more discussions do you have to put up about humans to say that these humans are the part of the role called human resources? You know, they're not workers, they're humans. We have to act. And Jenny, I, you say it might take a bit. I don't think we have a bit. No. I, mean, I am watching places close left and right and center because they can't find workers. It's real, it's now. This whole concept of the now of work that we laid out, like we're right now, like, I, I, this is like a pivotal point. Mm -hmm. And I just don't get it. I just don't get why organizations aren't changing from an HR standpoint, unless, the HR function is just ineffective. This is a question for the community. Are we at a place right now where if we're not doing something about this, that we just say we suck? If work has changed, workers have changed, business has changed, people are suffering, all that stuff, and we still do the same thing? That's like that's the definition of insanity to me. Just freaking do it. Like get out, show your leaders that employee experience, that candidate experience, that engagement can drive the way people are feeling now. I strongly believe that if a leader doesn't get this, that you've never shown them that you can do it. So guys, that was a little bit passionate, but I truly believe it's our time to show people that we can do this. We can build experience. We can build capability. We can change the role of HR from counting people to making people count. I get the really cool opportunity to do a keynote tonight to an organization in Indonesia. And I just share this with you for one reason. I got a call last night, two nights ago, from the CHRO of this company who said, I just wanna warn you that in the last week, we've had some changes. And I said, what are the changes? He said, we've had 75 people commit suicide. I was like, 
what? I mean, I was literally blown away. I was sharing this story earlier with someone. I was like, yeah, we're 20% vaccinated as a country. People are stressed out. They're maxed out. And he said, you know what the thing is that I think is going to help me through this? I'm the only person in the boardroom that has human in my title. I'm the only person in the room that has human in my title. I just totally fell in love with that. Um, so sorry to share that weird story at the end, but I love the human part of it. I truly believe that nothing changes unless we do. I hope this was helpful. If you guys would like a copy of this presentation, please scan that QR code. You'll get that, the copy of the presentation, which once again, happy to provide. Um, if you have questions about it, you'll get my email address or text, you can text whatever. Happy to provide it as well. Uh, once I see you, I'll put down your phones from taking selfies of yourself. I'll move on to the next slide. Um, and then the other thing I'll invite you guys to, if you take a picture of this, is that every Friday we do that meetup. It's 12 o'clock Central, 1 o'clock Eastern, it's free. We have 1,500 people every Friday. It's turned into, I, I, we started this as a way just to like keep people together while everyone was hurting during the pandemic. It's turned into like this weekly show, but feel free to uh, register. You never have to join, but if you do, it's also, the, it's also turned into a podcast every week.